Welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another 10 Amazing History Facts. Today I'm taking a look at Tampa's famous Gasparilla Festival and its origins. Themed to memorialize the life of pirate Jose Gaspar, it's the most popular one-day event in Florida and one of the largest annual events in the country. Up to half a million locals and tourists take part in or watch the massive event in banner years. Known officially as the Gasparilla Pirate Fest, these days it includes a flotilla of ships that make up the invasion force that demands the key to the city from the mayor of Tampa, as well as the parade of pirates and a music fest. So let's explore this interesting festival, its unusual origins, and how it evolved over the years. Ironically, as popular as Gasparilla has been and still is today, its chosen theme might not be one that would be obvious for a new festival. While pirates continue to be a popular subject with the Pirates of the Caribbean movie series generating nearly $5 billion at the box office, there's also obvious societal issues such as theft, murder, and things that YouTube would rather I not discuss. Before I get to the 10 amazing history facts of Gasparilla, I want to set the picture. Gasparilla, a word that struck fear in women and men throughout the Caribbean. Gasparilla, a word that stirred men's blood and drove them to lawlessness. Gasparilla, the single greatest terror to Florida's Gulf Coast. Gasparilla, or more properly Jose Gaspar, was a cunning and formidable pirate who's known as the terror of the Spanish Main. His life intersected with Florida's Gulf Coast, and unlike other pirates, his exploits were well documented. Astonishingly well documented. In the early 20th century, Gaspar would grab the brass ring of immortality when his life was the inspiration for Tampa's Gasparilla Fest. This is Gasparilla. More correctly, this is the Gasparilla Fest held on Valentine's Day 1955. These are clips from a movie produced for the city of Tampa. Things like this have been happening in Tampa Harbor ever since the Gasparilla Pirate Festival was created in 1904. Here, we have a full-rigged pirate ship right out of the 18th century. Hove to within gunshot of the city. Target for the night is Tampa's City Hall. The buccaneers are brazen indeed. They walk roughshod up the steps and at dagger's point, pinned to the door, the pirate chief demand for the surrender of the city. And so the pirates lightly turn to thoughts of uh, invading Tampa. This is no toy ship, the Jose Gasparilla. Built entirely of steel, it measures 171 feet overall, with masts that tower 100 feet aloft. The ship is a replica of a bark-rigged West Indiaman of the year 1800. Hundreds of small pleasure craft converge on Tampa from all parts of Florida to join the invasion armada. Here come the Marines in an amphibian tank, flying the Jolly Roger. You're seeing history made now. The Leathernecks leading a pirate invasion, hitting the beaches under the skull and bones. The pirates swarm ashore and prepare to parade in triumph through the streets of Tampa. Drummers of the Air Force from Washington, D.C. beat out a brisk starting signal. And Tampa's famous Gasparilla Pirates Parade, the number one spectacle parade of the nation, Steps off. Matched white horses 
draw the royal carriage float of the Pirate King, Gasparilla himself, chosen by lot from the Buccaneer crew, along with the beautiful queen of the pirates. Honorary Mayor of Tampa's Latin Quarter throws away stage money like a real politico. Most famous of the clowns in this parade is sad-faced Emmett Kelly, fugitive for the day from Ringling Circus. A true knight of the road, he's an annual feature of the Pirates Parade. This is something of a production number. During more than half a century, literally millions of visitors to Tampa have viewed this Gasparilla pirate spectacle, the invasion and triumphal parade of the pirates. They have acclaimed it as utterly unique in American pageantry. No wonder at all that it attracts the greatest crowds in all Florida. The old devil-may-care spirit is still showing as the pirates go yo-ho-hoing along in the second half century. So on to the story of Jose Gaspar. I'll admit to struggling with how to tell his story. See, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but Gaspar wasn't real. As far as we know, there's never been a pirate named Jose Gaspar, and certainly not one that was a captain of any ship. And that's what I've been wrestling with for several months. The whole point of my work is to provide historical facts and interpret them, but part of me wanted to tell Gaspar's story as if he were real much the way his biographers did in the early 20th century. I'd let you in on the reality eventually, but that process never made me happy, so I decided to lay it out at the start. As Billy Pilgrim would say, so it goes. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 1 The Origin of Jose Gaspar the various stories about Gaspar disagree about many parts of his life. I could try to provide you a bunch of the variations, but when talking about him, I normally refer to Jack Beater's book, Islands of the Florida Coast, which contains a lengthy 60-page biography of Jose based on a once-lost manuscript dated 1834 and penned by Jose's cousin, Leon Gaspar. This 1956 paperback is a later version of Beter's first book, The Gasparilla Story, printed in 1949. The 1956 book is pretty rare, so I feel lucky to own one while I've never seen the 49 edition. The book lists 1756 as the year of Jose Gaspar's birth. Born to Ramon and Dulce Gaspar, the location is described as a crumbling big house of an estate outside the city of Seville, Spain. His cousin Leon was a full decade older and had gone to sea when Jose was only two years old. They'd first meet each other when Jose was ten and Leon had returned from eight years at sea. The two struck up a fine friendship with Leon teaching basic sailing techniques and Jose teaching his cousin to read and write. Leon would eventually return to shipboard life while Jose was sent to the Académie Real de Navigation in Cadiz. Oddly enough, Cadiz never was home to a Royal Naval Academy. This is partly why historians know Gaspar wasn't a real person. Details such as this are simply wrong. For example, Gaspar's exploits describe battles with the navies of Spain, Britain, and even the young United States, yet there's no mention of him nor the ships he commanded in their records. And I promise you, they kept very good records. Once Gaspar left the academy, he became a midshipman in the Spanish Navy. Years passed as he rose through the ranks of military service. Jose and Leon would serve together on ships and have adventures in Spain, Cuba, Tripoli, and Mexico. 
By 1777, Jose was giving command of the brigantine Alborada. Remarkably, he was only 21. As Leon's memoir put it, Jose's superiors tasked him with hunting down a nest of pirates somewhere on the north coast. Many ships have been lost without a trace. In a short time, Jose was able to find the pirate's village, destroy it with gunpowder and gunfire, all the while Leon and a few marines would capture the pirate's schooner. Later, Jose was given a commission to protect Spanish shipping between Spain, Cuba, and Panama, and in 1783, Alborada was given the task of taking the new governor of Florida to St. Augustine, now that the British had given the territory back to Spain. Later, Jose learned he was to be made an admiral and be stationed at the royal court in Madrid. This is where life began going downhill for both Jose and Leon. Jose got in a fight with a well-connected nobleman, and while the nobleman lost a fight, he took his revenge by making it appear that Jose stole some of the queen's jewels. Learning of the terrible danger looming over their heads, Jose and Leon chose to run, booking passage on a merchantman bound for Hispaniola. Before they left, Leon went to the family home only to discover the house ablaze and Jose's mother, wife, and child killed by the king's soldiers. Told of the terrible deeds, Jose cried out, Please, hear me, God. I make a solemn oath that from this minute I am the enemy of Spain to my death and to every Spaniard who gives allegiance to the king. Jose and Leon then headed to the local jail to free 14 men who agreed to join them. Grabbing weapons, they headed to the port, climbed aboard the Navy's new warship Florida Blanca, killed the officers in their sleep, and took control. As you might guess, this was the start of his piracy. In the book Islands of the Florida Coast, Jose felt he was at war with Spain and not a pirate. Indeed, while his crew ransacked captured ships, Jose would engage the former ship's captain in what's described as friendly talk, in order to get news. He would also have the crews murdered, even having the females and children dispatched. Apparently, his own crew cared little for the children, but grumbled when they dropped a comely wench overboard. Florida Blanca ably served Jose, Leon, and the Brotherhood, as Jose's crew was known, until 1795 when it was captured by the Spanish Navy. The Brotherhood soon captured another ship that was renamed Dona Rosalia after Jose's murdered wife. This is when they headed to Florida and to Boca Grande, Spanish for Big Mouth, situated at the mouth of the ironically named Rio de la Paz or Peace River. There they developed a base of operations. Leon's manuscript details many other exploits between 1795 and 1821, the year that Florida would be sold to the United States for $5 million. By the way, the U.S. never paid that bill. In the same year, the Gaspars and their ship were cornered near Boca Grande. With no escape possible, Jose wrapped an anchor chain around his waist and plunged into the ocean. While islands of the Florida coast didn't record Jose's final words, other sources say that he yelled, Gasparilla dies by his own hand, not the enemy's. As I said before, there's no evidence that Jose Gaspar ever lived, and the unpublished manuscript of Leon Gaspar cannot be produced. Of course, this doesn't mean that Jose and Leon didn't exist. Proving that is nearly impossible. As the saying goes, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I'll explore more of the origins of Gaspar in a bit. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 2 the meaning of Gaspar's name. Gaspar came from the ancient Chaldean word Gizbar. Chaldean is related to Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus and the people in his community. Gizbar appears in the book of Ezra, part of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, also called the Old Testament, and it means treasurer. 
It still has that meaning in modern Hebrew. Gizbar would become Gaspar, and it retained the meaning, although it became a proper name, not just a profession. This appears to have happened in connection with a story from the New Testament. It appears in the Gospel of Matthew and is part of one of the most famous stories in Christianity. As you can see here, this is the first narrative of the birth of Jesus, and it tells about the arrival of the wise men from the East. It's a brief narrative that, like so much in the New Testament, grew into a much larger story. Are you aware that these brief passages comprise the entire information about the wise men? Today, people have the image of the wise men as being kings or high priests, and of course, there's three of them, each carrying a gift, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Names would be associated with them as well, Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar. And in some traditions, Gaspar presented the gold to the king of the Jews. This certainly works with the treasurer connection. However, it's also thought that Melchior was the gold bearer, so who knows? By the way, Melchior is made up of the Hebrew words king and light. It's unknown how the names came to be associated, but we have a good idea why they have remained known. In the 6th century, Roman Emperor Justinian had mosaics created in several churches, including in Ravenna, Italy. The mosaics depict the wise men and their names. You can still see some of them today. So that's Gaspar, but what of Gasparilla, the name that inspired a festival? In Spanish, Gasparilla means little Gaspar, a diminutive that one associates with a child. While early tales of Jose Gaspar, including islands of the Florida coast, say he was known as Gasparilla, they make no mention about how the name became associated with the bloodthirsty pirate. I'll also look more at that in a bit. Amazing Gasparilla fact number three, Juan Gomez and the Gasparilla Island Connection. There's good news for the third character in this story. Juan Gomez was real. However, we know much less about him than Gaspar, but his name will be forever linked with the Gaspars. We know Juan died in 1900. Some say it was in a boating accident. Jack Beaters says he fell overboard when fishing. We also know he lived for many years on Panther Key, a tiny island near North Captiva Island. In islands of the Florida coast, Juan was a cabin boy on a Spanish treasure ship captured by Donna Rosalia in 1801. He was about 10, and even though the Brotherhood cared little for children, he was saved. In turn, he'd become a personal servant for Leon. This and many other Gaspar stories purportedly came directly from Jose, though it's unclear as to when and even who he told the stories. We also can't tell if he was the originator of them or took inspiration from other sources. Little else can be proven about Juan. Census records show that he lived in Florida as early as 1850, but there's conflicting information in the 50 years of data. Here's the six entries, including the state census, as much of the documents of the 1890 census were destroyed in a fire. Note that while he's called Juan Gomez in most narratives, here he's listed as John. And it would have to be Juan who put John in the census. In 1850, Juan listed his age as 30, so born around 1820 says he was born in Portugal, worked as a seaman and fisherman, and married Sarah Ann, who was 25 and from Georgia. They were likely living on or near Cedar Key, as they're listed in the census of that part of Florida. Going forward, it's good to remember that the census accepts info provided by individuals, but doesn't necessarily check them. In 1860, it shows Juan as 61, so born about 1799. Birthplace is missing, and Sarah Ann has changed her age, stating she's just 30. By 1870, they moved to the Boca Grande area, where they'll remain for the rest of their lives. It has his age as 42, and doesn't list Sarah Ann at all. 
It's possible she was away, and Juan expected her to be counted elsewhere. Juan is listed as a seaman and shown as being from Nicaragua. In 1880, Juan leaps forward to the age of 95, aging 53 years in a decade, and placing his birth at 1785. He claims to be from France and is a woodchopper. Sarah Ann is 51. The 1885 Florida census lists Juan at 99 years old from Corsica and he's returned to fishing. In 1900, Juan continues to fish, his age is 124, having been born along with the United States in 1776. If we believe Juan's first reported age, he'd be 80 when he died, far short of the 124 years. Now, Juan was a real person and lived in the area where the Gasparilla story originates, and there's no doubt he was a teller of tall tales. For example, imagine your name is George Gatewood, and you've been sent to Panther Key in 1900 to interview Juan and Sarah Ann. Your own listing in the census shows that you live in the area, so you might even know them. When you visit, Juan tells you that he's 124 years old. How would you react? There's a number of second-hand reports of locals and visitors meeting Juan and hearing tales that were possibly fact, possibly fiction, or more likely a confusing mixture of both. Juan told of buried treasure, though no one learned where any of it was. He claimed that he was spared from hanging as part of Gaspar's brotherhood because he had stayed in Book Grande that fateful day. He escaped by rowing ten miles to the south in a small skiff with as much treasure as he could carry and hid out on Panther Key. But to be clear, I haven't seen any direct evidence that Juan ever told stories about Gaspar. And speaking of Boca Grande, it's located on Gasparilla Island. Aha! Well, there's some evidence that Jose Gaspar might be real, right? Well, take a look at this map from a book first printed in 1774. It shows most of the names of the Charlotte Harbor area, including Boca Grande, Captiva, Sanibel, the Caloosahatchee River, and of course Gasparilla. 1774 is long before Gaspar was said to have settled what would become Boca Grande in 1795. Today, Gasparilla Island is one of the most popular tourist locations in Florida, sporting two lighthouses and plenty of non-piratical history. As for where the name Gasparilla actually came from, no one really knows, though there's some who believe that a Spanish priest named Gasparilla worked on the island, and it's thought that a priest is more likely to be called Little Gaspar than a mean old pirate. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 4 the origin of Gasparilla Festival. At this point, this all raises some important questions. Was Juan Gomez the creator of the Gaspar legend? If not Juan, who was the creator? Evidence points to it originating in southwest Florida. The legend uses the name of Gasparilla Island as well as that of Captiva Island, which Gaspar used to imprison captives. That sounds plausible, but the Spanish word for captive is cautiva, with a U, not captiva. How did the story make it north to Tampa? Gasparilla Island is 80 miles away, and none of the early accounts of Gaspar's story mention Tampa Bay. Yet another aspect to the story is that many people will say that the legend of Gasparilla was created for an advertising brochure for the Charlotte Harbor and Northern Railroad Company. This is often mentioned by people in connection with the Gasparilla Fest. The society editor of the Tampa Tribune, Louise Francis Dodge, reportedly learned of the brochure in 1904 and decided that creating a pirate festival would be useful to turn Tampa into a tourist destination. Using her connections, she put a plan in motion to have a gathering of pirates performing an invasion that accompanied the city's May Day Parade. I'm not sure how true the tourist destination angle is, since the pirates were only a part of the already planned parade, but it's clear that she was the catalyst for Gasparilla, and maybe she was a visionary who could see what it'd turn into in the following decades. 
In the parade, the mystic crew of Gasparilla rode on horseback. If we can take the word of Dodge's newspaper, they were the hit of the parade. The Tribune wrote that the brilliantly costumed pirate crew made a handsome and dashing appearance, and it was the greatest feature of the festival. So that's truthfully how the festival got its start. But we need to look more at that brochure created for the Charlotte Harbor and Northern Railroad Company. It was likely written by a Pat Lemoyne, since years later he claimed it was a total fabrication intended to give the area a romantic history that would draw tourists, just like Dodge's vision. But guess what? There's a problem with all of this. Operating between Mulberry and Boca Grande, the CH&N was built to transport phosphate and passengers to the Gulf. While it began as the Alafia, Manatee, and Gulf Coast Railroad in 1897, the CHNN was chartered in 1905. The brochure isn't dated, and sadly I don't have a copy in the archive, but note that it couldn't have been produced until 1905 since the CHNN didn't exist before then. That's a year after the first appearance of the Mystic Crew in Tampa. And realistically, the brochure could have appeared in 1907 or later, since that's when the Boca Grande Land Company was formed to sell and develop real estate on Gasparilla Island. Until then, there was nothing to promote to tourists. And by tourists, I mean wealthy northerners who, it was hoped, would build their own winter cottages. That gives us a bad timeline. How could the railroad brochure be the inspiration for Gasparilla Fest if it was written after 1904? To recap, Jose and Leon Gaspar never lived. Juan Gomez was real, but might not have told the stories of the Gaspars. The CH&N brochure tells us about the Gaspars, but was printed after Gasparilla began. So where does that leave us? Frankly, I wish I knew. In 1905, the Mystic Crew would hold Gasparilla II, and this time it was part of a parade celebrating the opening day of the State Fair in November 1905. The parade also included all 60 automobiles that called Tampa home. The crew marched the next year as well, but in 1907 it was put on hold and wouldn't be celebrated for several years, partly due to the Panic of 1907. The Mystic crew geared up again in time for Tampa's Panama Canal celebration in 1910. In 1911, Gasparilla would use a ship to invade for the first time, something that's continued to this day. More on that later. 1913 saw the first Gasparilla-only parade, and festivities would be placed on hold during the two world wars. Throughout much of its history, Gasparilla was celebrated on the second Monday in February, but in 1988 it was changed to a Saturday festival for more convenience. Then in 2002, it was changed to the last Saturday in January. Amazing Gasparilla fact number five, the Mardi Gras connection. If you're at all familiar with Mardi Gras, the massive carnival celebration popular in New Orleans and throughout the Gulf Coast, you'll see how much Gasparilla resembles it. Often known as Mardi Gras season, it's officially a Catholic religious celebration, though in modern times many of the celebrants aren't Catholic and much of the celebrations are secular. Mardi Gras has two major aspects, balls, large formal parties, and parades. Both are organized by social clubs known as crews and follow the same parade schedule and route each year. It's thought that the spelling of crew was simply an affectation that was meant to imply an ancient tradition. The mystic crew of Comus, founded in 1856, is the oldest, continuous New Orleans crew and is thought to have been the first to use the creative spelling. The balls are private affairs where the annual kings and queens are enthroned. The royalty comes from the wealthy old families and the courts consisting of the season's teen debutantes. The parades are public, though the actual participants come from the crews. 
The mystic crew of Comus' name was inspired by John Milton's Lord of Misrule in his mask Comus, written in 1634. The crew of Comus's history, like that of all the other old crews, is tied to white supremacy much like the mystic crew of Gasparilla was. As you can see, Mardi Gras, in both organization and events, was the primary inspiration for the Gasparilla Fest. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 6 The Florida State Fair Connection the Gasparilla Pirate Fest was associated with the Florida State Fair for much of the 20th century. Both had their origins in 1904. However, this was a coincidence, as the first year saw the pirates ride on horseback with the invasion staged at the Tampa Bay Hotel, today the location of the Plant Museum, and it wouldn't be until the next year that the two events joined up. Known initially as the South Florida Fair, it held its first fair in downtown Tampa. There were fairs held in the Tampa area before, since agricultural fairs have been popular in the U.S. long before Florida even joined the nation. The South Florida Fair was renamed Florida State Fair in 1915, but it wouldn't be until 1975 that the Florida legislature created the Florida State Fair Authority. It's this entity that now runs the Florida State Fair. In 1977, the fair was moved out of downtown into its current location in eastern Hillsborough County. It'd be at this point that the Gasparilla Fest would be separated from the fair. The fair is held each February and is the first state fair each year in the United States. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 7 The Odom-Sanford Map of Florida Unlike the previous map, dated to 1774, this is a much more recent one, having been published in 1950. Titled, Ye True Chart of Pirate Treasure Lost or Hidden in the Land and Waters of Florida, it was created by Ralph Odom and illustrated by Warner Sanford. One source states Sanford was a civil engineer with the Florida Department of Transportation, he was also an artist, though this map is his only commonly known work. Odom was a Florida assistant attorney general and someone who was fascinated by treasure finds around Florida. After years of research in which Odom identified the locations of wrecks, many of which supposedly had treasure, he developed this map. It's unknown how he arrived at the sum of $165 million listed in the map's legend, but it's an interesting amount. For in 1975, Mel Fisher and his team of shipwreck salvers would find the bulk of the remains of the Nuestra Senora de Atocha, a Spanish treasure galleon, wrecked in 1622 during a hurricane in the Keys. The value of the treasure recovered from the Atocha was roughly $130 million, nearly the amount Odom estimated for all of Florida. The map is a mixture of reality and fantasy, with illustrations of pirates, conquistadors, indigenous people, and historic locations. The border lists nine individuals, only some of which were pirates. Along with Gasparilla and Gomez, there's Blackbeard, one of the most famous pirates, named Edward Teach. He was an English pirate who operated around the Caribbean and the coast of Spanish and British North America. As famous as he is, his career as a pirate lasted for only three years between 1716 and his death in 1718. Pierre and Jean Lafitte were brothers and famous pirates. Born in France, or possibly French-controlled Haiti, they were privateers and pirates about a hundred years after Blackbird. They were also smugglers and spies at various points in their life, yet they helped the U.S. defend New Orleans during the War of 1812, as they called that seaport home. Sir Henry Morgan was a Welsh privateer, plantation owner, and a lieutenant governor of Jamaica. His career saw him leading crews that raided ports and ships around the Spanish Main, since he worked primarily with the approval of the British Crown, he was one of the few successful pirates and was able to purchase sugar plantations in Jamaica with his booty. 
John Rackham, better known as Calico Jack, was an Englishman who spent much of his time pirating around Cuba, the Bahamas, and Florida. He was a contemporary of Blackbeard, and much like him, Calico Jack's career as a pirate appears to have been rather brief, from 1718 to capture and execution in 1720. Little is known about his life apart from having two women in his crew, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, with Bonny supposedly his lover. Both were captured with Calico Jack and sentenced to death. Reed died in prison, likely from complications of a pregnancy, and there's no record as to what happened to Bonnie. William Augustus Bowles was originally from the Maryland colony and fought on the Loyalist side during the American Revolution. Later on, he joined with indigenous tribes and tried to establish an independent country in Florida with British support. Known as the state of Muskegee, it failed and Bowles was captured and turned over to the Spanish in 1803. He died in a Cuban prison of self-imposed starvation. Black Caesar was a West African pirate who was active at the beginning of the 1700s. We know that he served as part of Blackbeard's crew and survived the battle in which Blackbeard was killed, but little else is known about him, though it's said he was a pirate in the Keys before joining Blackbeard. William Rogers, sometimes known as Billy Bowlegs, might be a real person, though his historicity isn't clear. It's possible that he was a member of Jean Lafitte's crew and it's thought he was active in the 1830s and 40s along the Gulf Coast. There are stories that he left his treasure buried somewhere in the Panhandle. This unusual and unique map is an interesting part of Florida's history, and it's likely that it helped fuel the 1950s rise in treasure hunting in Florida water, though it was aided by the growth of scuba diving technology. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 8 the ships, Jose Gaspar and Jose Gasparilla. Obviously, the Gasparilla flotilla and its iconic sailing ship, crammed with pirate revelers, is the most famous scene during each year's festival. But it wasn't until 1911 that a ship was used to invade Tampa. It was, of course, a natural development, as few pirates have ever been seen in a street parade. There have been three ships of note that played the role of Jose Gaspar's sloop, the Donna Rosalia. The first was built in 1868 at Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She worked on the Great Lakes and transported lumber. Christened the C.H. Hackley, she was a sailing ship, though at some point a steam boiler was added. Around 1916, she was moved to Mobile, Alabama and worked around the Caribbean and Central America. By 1920, Hackley was owned by William Fielder out of Tampa, and it was then that she was enlisted to be part of Gasparilla. Rechristened Jose Gaspar, she'd travel in Tampa Bay and up the Hillsboro River. Her smokestack was removed, as all Gasparilla ships are towed by a tugboat. By 1932, she was far from ship shape and was retired. In 1933, she was towed out into the Gulf and deliberately sunk. Gasparilla's next ship, William Bisbee, was a three-masted schooner. 133 feet long and 31 feet wide, she was built in 1902 in Rockland, Maine, and worked the Atlantic coast from Nova Scotia to Florida and over to Central America. She operated in the coast-wide trade until 1932, when she was sold to Captain Charles Taylor, who ran her in the offshore trade until 1936. In that year, Bisbee would be sold to Captain G.A. Hansen, who was then commander of the mystic crew of Gasparilla. Her rigging was converted to that of a barkentine, with square-rigged masts that included yard arms, which one contemporary report suggested the crew could use to hang their victims. The poop deck was also raised, and both of these modifications gave Bisbee more of a pirate ship appearance. By the way, the origin of the term poop is from a French word for stern, as the poop deck sits at the rear. It's the roof of the after cabin, or poop cabin, typically the captain's quarters. 
And yes, the other definition for poop likely comes from the same source, referring to the back end. Once modified, it was rechristened Jose Gaspar and entered service in Tampa through the rest of the 1930s and through the 40s. Between 42 and 46, Gasparilla wasn't celebrated due to World War II. And because the focus was on war and not on the festival, the Jose Gaspar was the worst for a lack of attention, and so in 1946 she was overhauled. The next year her foremast was splintered by lightning, and in 1952 saw her final appearance in a Gasparilla flotilla. For the next two years, the Mystic crew was back to borrowing ships, but due to the economic prosperity of the 1950s, the crew was ready to commission their own ship. She'd be a 165-foot-long and 35-foot-wide replica of an 18th-century three-master. She's a pretty standard ship, albeit a bit large for most pirate ships, that tended to be smaller, more maneuverable, and faster than the typical cargo or warship. On the other hand, the crew made a very wise choice in the construction of the new ship. While both Jose Gaspar 1 and 2 were wood hulled and eventually succumbed to rot, worm damage, and leaks, the new ship was constructed of steel, including its 100 foot tall masts, allowing for easier maintenance. Christened Jose Gasparilla in 1954, the ship continues to serve the Mystic crew to this day. As with previous ships, Jose Gasparilla is only used for the festival and is moored the rest of the year. Serving as a tourist attraction, much like St. Petersburg's famous sailing ship, Bounty. By the way, I recently did a video on Bounty. As I mentioned in that one, I'd have loved to see a battle between Bounty, a ship of the British Navy, and Jose Gasparilla. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 9 the controversy, and the new cruise. It's not at all surprising the Gasparilla Fest would have some controversy, which came to a head in 1991. It was a long time coming, however, originating at the very beginning of the formation of the mystic crew of Gasparilla in 1904. As you've seen, regardless of how the legend of Gasparilla came to be, the structure of the organization was based on the crews of Mardi Gras, specifically the white, moneyed crews that controlled much of the huge multi-day event in New Orleans. Both the Crescent City and Tampa have been long racially diverse, as well as heavily segregated. Tampa had a white economic elite who owned the businesses and ran the government. There was also a large working class community of immigrants from Latin America, especially Cuba, formerly enslaved blacks, and some European immigrants. As you can probably guess, considering it was a newspaper society editor who suggested the idea for Gasparilla, the people initially included in the festivities were Tampa's white elite, and specifically only men. Of course, women were welcome to help out, but from the very beginning, the mystic crew of Gasparilla welcomed only wealthy white men as members. This actually caused a weird sort of irony each year. The crew's pirate invasion culminates in a ceremony where the mayor of Tampa turns over the key to the city to the pirates. But the pirates are some of the most powerful people in the city and often include its elected officials. A lot of times, even the mayor is a member. Basically, this means that the men in charge can control the city over to themselves. The crew is also associated with the White Municipal Party a white supremacist political party dedicated to remove any black influence in local elections. Black people were denied membership and couldn't participate in primaries, which was where the elections were actually determined. Each Tampa mayor between 1910 and 1956 was a member of the white municipal party. Another irony was that the Gasparilla ship, flotilla, and parade were watched by a mixed-race audience of thousands from the city and around the state. While it remained popular through the 20th century, in the 1960s, the civil rights movement caused significant changes to be made, 
ending state of enforced segregation, and the inclusion of Hispanic and black tampons in politics. Still, Mystic Crew membership remains restricted to the city's leading white men, and it wouldn't be until the 1990s when the protests of civil rights leaders got any traction with Gasparilla. In 1991, the fest was to be the biggest ever, since it was scheduled for the day before Tampa would host the Super Bowl. Tampa's largest celebration would be covered by the press in town for the big game. The Mystic Crew even moved the parade to Super Bowl weekend so it could be part of the event. At the time, the Mystic Crew had 750 members, all of which were white and male. Each year, the crew was in charge of Gasparilla and paying the bills, but the city provided police, medical, and cleanup support. In reality, Gasparilla was an event organized and led by the city's white and powerful men who paraded through the streets dressed up as murdering pirates and throwing fake gold coins to the crowd. Since this was going to be broadcast to the entire country, many people felt it was time for things to change. Mayor Sandy Friedman, along with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the National Football League, joined with a coalition of local organizations in asking the crew to desegregate in time for the parade. The crew responded by canceling the parade. They argued that they never set out to make the crew all white. It's just that there was never any black applicants. You know, over 87 years. Henry Carley, the president of the local chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, said, No black man has ever been invited to imply. And this was true. Applicants needed members to sponsor them over a multi-year process. Happily, the Mystic Crew would agree to admit black members later that year. One of the most significant developments of the 1991 disagreement was that many other Gasparilla crews formed over the past 30 years, with some open to anyone, while others specifically welcome women, veterans, Cuban Americas, or other individual groups. And yes, the Mystic crew is integrated. However, it remains male only to this day. Amazing Gasparilla Fact Number 10 The Tampa Bay Buccaneer Connection in the fall of 1976, Tampa became the second city in Florida to get a National Football League team. The year before, the expansion team got the name Tampa Bay Buccaneers through a public contest, and they quickly became associated with the Gasparilla Pirate Fest. 1975 also saw the creation of the team's logo. Created by local artist Lamar Sparkman, it served the Bucks well for its first 20 years. The logo was the visage of a buccaneer, but not one that fit the common idea of pirates, such as these at Disney World. Sparkman was a well-known cartoonist for the Tampa Tribune and illustrated anything sports-related. Speaking of his design, he said, I approached it with the idea that he was a cavalier, not a hairy-legged slob. The plume feather adds class, I think. I put the dagger in his mouth to add aggression, and then I had him wink. It's a half wink and half sneer. The figure received the name, Bucko Bruce. He resembles the actor Errol Flynn, especially in his roles as Robin Hood and Captain Blood, both of which were good men who, like Jose Gaspar, were pushed into rebellion and piracy. By the way, the original team colors of the Bucks were orange and white. Interestingly, in their first year, they played every game in white uniforms, which are normally reserved for away games. They got the orange the next year. The orange represented Florida state fruit, but the shade also chosen by Sparkman became known as creamsicle. The crimson red was a secondary color, though it would become the primary color after 1996. After years of looking at this issue, I don't really have any answers as to how and when the story of Gasparilla originated. Historians love to solve mysteries, and the origins of Gasparilla is one of the biggest mysteries in Florida. We also like to tell a good story, although it has to be one that's fact, not fiction. 
When it comes to this story, however, fiction is in great abundance. Maybe someday we'll discover the real story of the origin of Jose Gasparilla. Thank you for watching another of my videos. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.